Uh, hello, welcome. And my name is David Shaw. Uh, welcome to Simplifying 5 Access Programming with GiveScan. Uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be showing you how simple creating 5 Access Toolpaths can be with GiveScan. Uh, as the presentation progresses, if you have any questions, enter them in the Q&A panel on your screen and we will answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Over the last 38 years or so, GIMSCAM has built a reputation by simplifying complex CNC programming. Part of the simplification is simply organizing the information and parameters needed to fit the way a machinist thinks, the way that a machinist basically approaches machining a part. By effectively streamlining and organizing the input of parameters and minimizing how many parameters you have to deal with, GIMSCAM shortens the learning curve, greatly reduces programming time, and most importantly, leaves you in control of few or as many of the details as you want or need to be in control of. All right, so here's the part we're going to be looking at. Let's see how this toolpath was developed. All right, to start off with, uh, I'm going to uh, take a look at what we have to deal with. So what I'm concerned with right now is machining this radius here. And uh, I'm going to turn on the profiler for a second and uh, go to a end view here. And right here you see that this, this radius is actually undercut slightly, which would make it uh, really impossible to machine with a ball end mill in a three axis machine. Uh, so we're going to machine this in five axis mode. Additionally, if I take a look at that radius, uh, it's just under a 3 8 radius, so we'll machine that with a half inch ball mill. So let's get started putting some toolpaths together. Uh, so I'm going to open up my cam and uh, create a 5 axis process. And uh, I'll select this half inch and the whole half inch ball mill. And when I build a uh, 5 axis process, uh, I'm presented with a, a dialog specific to 5-axis processes. And just like any other GibbsCam process dialog, it separates the tasks or the, the groups of parameters and controls into individual tabs. And uh, within those tabs, particular types of, of parameters and controls are uh, separated into different areas. This makes it a lot easier to focus on individual toolpath control challenges and really helps you focus on the trees rather than getting bogged down in the forest. When you're programming complex parts, the job often becomes a lot simpler and certainly less intimidating when you break it down into individual tool paths rather than becoming overwhelmed by the overall complexity of the job. So taking a look at this, so looking at the, the uh, tabs that we have, um, we have a number of tabs. There's seven in this particular environment. Uh, we're looking at options right now. And this allows us to set our speeds and feeds for the toolpath, how we want the wrap, the retract to uh, behave, a rapid or a feed retract, uh, our coolant options, uh, rotary duplicates if we want them. We can duplicate our toolpath uh, around the, the platter, if you will. And uh, the machining coordinate system, the, the coordinate system that we want the toolpath to occur in. Uh, additionally, we have this drop-down dialog. Uh, it's currently set to general, which basically means that we have access to all seven of these tabs, and we have control over virtually every aspect of the toolpath. And additionally, we can select particular uh, types of five-axis machining. Uh, projection, swarf machining, different different types of uh, five-axis specific machining. And what happens when we select one of these is that uh, the software in the background sets a lot of the parameters for us, uh, parameters that are generally specific to that type of machining, and reduces the amount of data that we have to enter. So you can see for projection machining, a pretty simple page uh, to fill out uh, to get projection machining, and then a linking page, which we'll go over the linking page later. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that if you're creating a specific toolpath type, uh, and maybe there's some aspect of that toolpath you're not entirely happy with, you can go back to the general 
setting and those preset parameters are still valid in these other tabs, which means that uh, you could go back in, uh, if, we, if we recreated the toolpath, now it would be exactly the same as it was when we were in the projection tab, uh, but uh, we can go in and access control over any aspect of the toolpath and tweak it. Uh, a byproduct of that is it's a really good idea anytime you're starting a five axis process to get restore defaults. Uh, just to make sure all the settings are what you expect them to be. So let's move on to the Surface Paths tab. Now the Surface Paths is where we uh, define the, the tool path as far as the, um, the intersection or the contact point between the cutting tool and the surfaces being cut. Uh, and we can calculate that based on a number of things, uh, including surfaces, triangle mesh, the underlying triangle mesh, or wireframe, uh, swarf machining, multi-axis machining, which has some really nice roughing patterns in it, including uh, adaptive roughing and five axis. And we also have geodesic machining, which is a uh, a different algorithm for calculating the transition between tool toolpath nodes uh, that gives you a very smooth, very consistent toolpath, and uh, some really nice deburring strategies. For the time being, we're going to focus, though, on surfaces, toolpath based on surfaces. Um, moving down, we have the toolpath pattern. Uh, we have a choice of parallel cuts, and uh, I would encourage you to kind of watch this uh, diagram over here, uh, or this picture. Uh, which will change as we select different things. So we can see that a parallel cut uh, is essentially straight line parallel cuts. It's, it's very similar to a lace cut in three axis surfacing, uh, except it's in the five axis world. Uh, we can create toolpath perpendicular to a curve, or we create some sort of curve, uh, and the toolpath will always run perpendicular at the point at which it crosses the curve. Uh, the curve does not have to be a straight line like this shows. It can be a complex curve. Uh, one of my favorites is morph between two curves, uh, which starts with one shape, the tool pass following that shape, and as it works its way across the drive surfaces, the surfaces that we're cutting, it transitions to a different shape at the other side. We can also uh, run parallel to a curve, we can project curves, we can morph between two surfaces, which is very similar to morph between two curves. Uh, we can run parallel to the surface or create flow line machining. Uh, for this part, uh, I'm just going to select more between two surfaces. So to get started with my toolpath, uh, I need to start making some definitions of what I want to cut. Uh, I'm going to define my drive surfaces first. So I'm just going to right click down here and select all of those spaces, deselect that, and that leaves me with my undercut radius as the surfaces that I want to machine. Now, I've got edit surfaces that I need to Fine. The first edit surface is going to be this surface up here. And I'm going to click OK. And, and by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, if you're in a dialog and you have an OK button in 5-axis especially, click OK to, to get out of that dialog. Uh, because if you don't click OK, you lose the settings that you have set in that dialog. You need to click OK to accept those settings. So what I just did by defining this blue surface as my first edit surface, uh, my toolpath is going to begin where the drive surface, the yellow surfaces, intersect the blue surface. And I'm going to define my second edit surface as this one. All right, so we're going to start cutting at this intersection. We're going to finish cutting at this intersection. Uh, in addition, we could define a drive surface clearance. And again, the picture changes to show us what they're talking about. So this tells me that a positive number in there will actually stop short of the tool reaching the actual surface by whatever amount you enter in that field. Zero will put the tool exactly on the surface, and a negative value will uh, impinge the surface, or it'll cut into the surface by the amount specified. Uh, this part's already been rough, so uh, I'm going to cut right to the finished surface. Then we can move down to the area. These are essentially modifying the area being cut. Um, it, it may seem redundant since we've said we want to cut this yellow area, but we can we can tweak that somewhat. Uh, we can do a full cut 
but avoid cuts at the exact surface edges. Uh, this is going to step over the amount that we specified, but it's going to avoid making a pass at the exact edge of the surface. Or we can cut the full shape and force a start and end at the exact surface edges. This will modify the step over uh, and force a pass at the exact surface edges, uh, which is what we're going to do here. Uh, alternately, we can control the area cut by the number of cuts or limit it by one or two points. Uh, so we're going to do a full cut starting and ending at the exact surface edges. Uh, additionally, we have some further modifiers here. Uh, if there were sharp inside corners, we could control how the software handles those. Uh, we can do a bow tie, or we can have the software uh, simulate or uh, internally create a radius in there so that uh, a tool larger than the radius is not gouged without having to do gouge checking on it. Uh, we can also extend or trim the pool path. Uh, we can extend it along the, the strokes or trim it along the strokes, and we can also extend it along or trim it along the width. We can specify the angle range that we want the tool path to occur in, or we can, uh, we can create 2D containment boundaries for the tool path. As far as sorting, uh, just briefly, we can flip the step over, which just reverses, rather than going from here to here. If I did a flip step over, it would start down here and go up. It just reverses the order of the strokes. Uh, we can also control the uh, pattern, if you will, or the directionality. Uh, we can zigzag, go one direction, or spiral. Since this is a closed loop, I definitely either want to go one way or spiral. And I typically will choose spiral most of the time. So we're going to spiral, and then the direction for one-way machining, uh, we have climb, conventional, or we can specify clockwise and counterclockwise. Uh, I'm going to specify counterclockwise. Uh, sometimes the difference between climb and conventional uh, is not so obvious in the five-axis world as it is in the three-axis world. So I'm just going to specify that I want the tool to go counterclockwise. And then we have our maximum step over. It defaults to 50. I'm going to bump that up just a little bit for our um, for toolpath calculation speed uh, here at the beginning uh, while we're still tweaking toolpath. And I'm going to go ahead and click Do It and see what the results are. I'm going to also come down here and open up my progress bar and lock it in place so that uh, I can kind of keep track of what's going on. And what we end up with here is what looks at least at first glance, to be beautiful toolpath. Um, it's a very nice spiral. There's no, you know, no uh, abrupt step downs. It's just a smooth spiral toolpath. Cuts beautifully from the beginning of that surface to the ending of the surface. And if you don't look too closely, um, you know, you might be initially pleased with this right up to the point where you simulate it. So I'm going to go to my operation sim and. Uh, Sorry, one thing that I need to fix here. I'm going to go to my operation sim and watch this run, and it's not really going to be as pretty as we had thought it would be. I'm going to move this a little more convenient and hit play. And uh, so that's probably not the best strategy for getting into the park and not the best way to, uh, to tilt that tool while cutting this part. Uh, but if you look at the tool path, the tool path, the point of contact between the tool and the part is good. What we fail to do is to adequately control the axis of the tool or the center line of the tool. Uh, some people think of it as controlling the back end of the tool. Um, and, and we kind of, once you have uh, some time in this environment, you would have realized right away just by looking at this entry move and this exit move that the, the, the tilt of that tool was not quite what we had in mind. All right, so how can we control that? Uh, let's take a brief look at our um, process. And we can see that we looked at options, we looked at surface paths, and then the next tab is tool axis control. And that's what we need to do is we need to control our tool axis. So again, we're breaking this down into uh, pages that, that deal with the same set of tasks, if you will. 
So one thing we have here is the ability to limit our tool path to three axis or four axis, or we can produce full five axis output. Of course, we're going to produce full five axis output here. Uh, we have a maximum angle step, and this is the maximum angle that your uh, platter can rotate in a single toolpath node. Uh, and then here's the really what we're concerned with, how the tool axis is controlled. The tool axis will be tilted relative to the cutting direction. Well, tilted relative to the cutting direction with zeros in both of these fields, uh, zero liter lag angle and zero uh, side tilt, effectively keeps that tool perpendicular to the surface being cut, uh, which is exactly what we saw here. Uh, other choices here are to not be tilted but stay normal to the surface, tilted with a specific angle, tilted with a specific angle relative to an axis, or rotated around an axis, or tilted through a point or tilted through a curve. Now these are very, very useful. Uh, tilted through a point or tilted through a curve uh, requires a point or a curve that is behind or above the, the cutting tool uh, when it's cutting. And the center line of that tool projected back through the holder, if you will, will always be pointed or oriented to that point or that curve. Conversely, we also have tilted from point away and tilted from curve away which is kind of the opposite. You have a point or a curve that's below or projected along the axis of the tool through the point of the tool, uh, and the, the tool will always stay pointed toward that point or that curve. So I think the strategy that I want to use here is going to be tilted through a curve, and really before I can do that, I need to have a curve to tilt it through. So I'm going to select the surface and just extract the edges of it. And then I'm going to take that curve, and in my geometry palette, I'm going to offset it. And uh, I'll offset it uh, an inch. I'm going to get rid of the geometry that I don't need, and I'm left with this. All right, so this is a curve that's kind of parallel to, but inside the shape that I'm cutting, uh, smaller than the shape that I'm cutting. Uh, however, with it being down on the the floor of this pocket it really doesn't do me any good because if I project the center line of my tool through this, I'm still still gouging. So I need to modify this somewhat. So I'm going to uh, translate this up. And uh, we'll go, say, a half inch a couple of times, and maybe one more time. So that's an inch and a half above the floor of that pocket. And then I can kind of test that briefly or quickly just by rolling this thing around and kind of lining this up with the matching portion of the surface behind it and get an idea of how much tilt is going to be required to get the tool there. And, and that's, a, that's a good amount of tilt. I'm, I'm pleased with that. I, I'm not risking hitting the back edge of the part with my tool or my holder, and I can easily, I can easily get to that undercut there. So with that built, I'm going to load my process back in which reselects everything, by the way, uh, rebuilds my toolpath and reloads my process with all the parameters set the way that they work when that process was built. So all I need to do to tweak this toolpath is come over to my tool axis control and come down and say, I want my tool to be tilted through a curve. And my tilt curve is going to be that. And hit OK. We'll recalculate the toolpath, and if you watch our entry and exit move here, you should see them realign with our tilt curve. And you see they're, now they're projected toward that tilt curve. So let's go back and watch the simulation again. And this time I'm going to lock the simulation to the machine. I'm going to start it simulating. And we see the tool comes down without crashing through the part. If I go to a home view, I'm going to be looking straight down the, the tool, right down the center line of the tool. And you can see that our tilt curve stays right in line with the center line of the tool right there. So controlling the tilt while it's doing this cut is very, very simple. Let's take this a step further. 
a lot of parts aren't really this simple. Uh, they're simple, or they may be very, very complex. Uh, but uh, perhaps this part uh, has more features to it than, than just what we see here. Maybe there's uh, features back over in here, and some of those maybe overshadow or overhang this pocket slightly. And um, that can be simulated like this. So we have this piece, which if we highlight that and go to the top view, we can see it overhangs our pocket a little bit. And I believe that's going to be enough that we get a gouge. Uh, we need the tool to stay away from this, but we still need it to tilt and uh, get the undercut here uh, without gouging. Uh, now, there, there would be a tendency here to tweak or to change this geometry that we're using for our tilt curve uh, to pull this side of it back a little bit to force more tilt so the tool can get up underneath this. Uh, but that's really not necessary. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into um, stock so that we can see it in our rendering. Let's just watch that run briefly. I'm going to lock that to part this time. I just want to see it come around here, and we should see that we're gouging. We're scalloping this feature here uh, just slightly. And again, just imagine that this is some feature of the part that just kind of gets in the way. So rather than really changing our geometry here, what I want to do is go into my process and do gouge checking. Uh, so I'm going to go into the gouge check page, and GibbsCam allows you four gouge check strategies that can be run together, and they'll actually run sequentially, or they cascade. Uh, I only need one gouge check strategy, so I'm going to turn one off, and I can check the flute and or the shank and or the uh, front of the holder and or the back of the holder. Uh, in this case, I probably just need to check the tool. I'm not too concerned about the holder, uh, so we'll do the flute and the shaft. Now, this column allows me to say what I want to happen if it detects an approaching gouge. Uh, retracting the tool is very good in some situations, but in this case, it doesn't help us. What I need it to do is to tilt the tool. All right, I want it to tilt the tool, and very, very often, automatic works great for this. I'm just going to leave this on automatic. And then what do I want to gouge check against? Uh, I don't need to gouge check against my drive surfaces, the yellow surfaces, they're fine. Uh, but I do want to define some check surfaces. So, you know, half thousandths tolerance is fine, maybe a bit tight, but uh, it's fine. And uh, how much stock do I want to leave? How much distance do I want to have between the edge of my tool and the surface that it's checking against? I'm just going to give it a sixteenth of an inch. And then what are my check surfaces? Uh, I'm going to define those as being that entire body right there. And with that done, I'm going to hit redo. Let the toolpath recalculate. And uh, I'm going to go down to an end view here and go back to my simulation. And uh, I'm going to put my point of view lock on fixed part and run this. And what I want to see is if that tool is tilting, I'm going to slow it down a little bit, and you can already see that it's tilting below the curve as it comes around here. It's tilting more than it was on the other side to get to keep the tool away from the surfaces that we're checking against. I'm going to rewind that and change my point of view to the machine. And again, go to a home view, so we'll be looking straight down on the tool. And here you see our tool is centered up just the way we told it to on our tilt curve. And somewhere along in here, it should be detecting an approaching gouge. And we see that tool start moving off of the tilt curve. 
until it's completely off the tilt curve, and then it comes back on, but it never quite makes it centered up on it, and it tilts back off over on this side. And then as we come on around, away from the interference, the tool lines back up with the tilt curve. So I showed you that just to kind of emphasize that it's not an abrupt change. It's a, it's a very smooth transition. It detects the approaching gouge. It starts making adjustments for that ahead of time. I'm going to deselect everything, and uh, let's go ahead and finish this part. Uh, I'm going to open up my cam again. Let's do a little more machining. I'm going to clear that process out. I'm going to create another five-axis process. And for this one, I need a finishing end mill. It's going to be a square end mill. A little bit of corner radius won't hurt. Uh, those settings are fine. And I'll open that up. And since I'm going to change the style of machining uh, pretty significantly, I definitely want to get restore defaults on this. I'm going to go to my surface path page. And for this one, instead of my calculations being based on surfaces, I want to base my calculations on swarf machining. And swarf machining is where you cut with the edge of the uh, or the side of the tool, um, and it's a great way for finishing rule surfaces, uh, surfaces where you can create a flat line, a, a direct line from one edge to the other at some angle. Uh, so we're going to do swarf machining, and uh, this is going to be a roughing pass, so I'm going to keep the tool 20 thousandths away from the finished surface. And uh, I'm going to define my swarf surfaces as being these. So that's what we're machining. And then uh, I'm, instead of using tilt lines, I'm going to use guide curves. So I'll turn my edges on and select my upper guide curve as this. And I'm going to select my lower guide curve as that. All right, so we're saying 20 thousandths away, I've defined my upper and lower guide curves and my swarf surfaces. Now, this is a roughing pass, so I'm going to go ahead and go to multi-cuts. I'm going to tell it to do this in two slices. So it's going to cut halfway down and then the other half. Uh, and then in addition to that, since the bottom edge of the tool is going to be controlled by this uh, geometry here, um, I want the tool to go a little bit past that. I want to ensure that I don't end up with a wire edge down here. So I can do a tool shift along the axis right here until we give it a negative 30 thousandths. And I'll close that. Let's go ahead and build in our finishing pass. I'm just going to use the same tool for it. Um, and everything really can stay the same, except that I don't need to leave 20,000 stock. And I don't need to take two passes. I still want to overshoot the bottom by 30,000, though. All right, so with those set, I'm going to create that tool path, and we should see a short, you know, a, a halfway down roughing, all the way down roughing, and then a finishing pass here. And that's exactly what we have. This is our cut halfway down, leaving 20,000 stock. Our cut 30,000 past the bottom, leaving 20,000 stock. And our finishing pass. So let's see that simulate. Let's see just that simulate. All right, so here's our swarf halfway down, and we see that red right there is kind of warning me that the tool is rapiding in contact with the part, and I expected that because we haven't controlled that yet. I will go ahead and verify that the rest of the tool path is what I wanted. So that finishes up our roughing. 
and there's our finishing. And again, it's wrapping in contact with the part. So how are lead-in and lead-outs handled in 5-axis? Let me just make sure this process is loaded. Let's go back into our roughing first. And lead-in, lead-outs, and really anything that has to do with how the tool gets from one place to another is handled on the link page. And we have uh, several areas of control. Our first entry and last exit, everything about that is controlled here. Gaps along the cut, this would be if there were a small void along the stroke uh, or any void along the stroke, uh, or a mathematical void, uh, something that you can't see, but just because of tilting, uh, that happens very occasionally, how that is handled. Uh, you also have links between slices, which is a link between two different strokes or two different slices, and links between layers. If you're doing roughing, uh, you have multiple layers and you can control how those are handled. So on the first entry, when the tool is first getting started, I want it to use a lead in. And when it gets finished, I want it to use a lead out. Okay, that's simple enough. And then the links between slices, uh, I'm going to have it use a lead in. Actually, let's do a lead in and a lead out. All right, so uh, between slices, between layers, and on first entry, uh, last exit, we're using lead in and or lead out. Now, the lead in, lead out is controlled by the default lead in, lead out, or you can specify something specific for each one of these with these little buttons off to the side. But I'm going to use the same strategy for everything. Uh, and one that uh, works real well for, well, they all work real well for me, but one that works real well for me and it's really easy is just automatic arc. It does a great job of figuring entry exit. So I, I set my lead in style over here, and then to transfer this data over to my lead out rather than having to enter anything again, I can just copy it over. Hit OK, and recalculate my tool path. Well, actually, before I do that, let me do the same thing to my finishing pass come down to link, and here all I'm concerned with is my first entry and last exit. And now we'll recalculate our toolpath. All right, and there we have it. Uh, and you can see the entry exit moves over here, um, and we can run our Operation simulation, again, just on the selected operations. And you can see the, the uh, rapid in contact with the part is fixed. All right, in the, I don't know, the last half hour, 35 minutes or so, uh, we haven't gotten in a rush. We've taken our time, and yet we've programmed a five-axis finishing pass uh, on, you know, on the undercut radius. We tweaked that tool path. We tweaked it again to provide gouge avoidance and develop roughing and finishing tool path for a swarf profile. Uh, the task associated with developing these tool paths is laid out in a simple, easily understood manner. Uh, it makes it easier to learn, it reduces the programming time, and lessens the risk of mistakes. Uh, the speed at which you can make these changes really lets you try multiple toolpath strategies to see what you like best. I used to call it playing what-if games. What if I change this? What if I change that? Uh, the changes are so quick to make and the toolpath calculates so quickly most of the time that uh, it's very easy to try a couple of different strategies and see what you like, what you think is going to fit your needs the best. That concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. Uh, I think we have some time to address a few questions. Uh, during the presentation, Bart Ellers, another Gibbs Cameron reseller, uh, has been collecting and collating the questions for us, and uh, he'll join us now. Bart? Hey, David. Thanks for the uh, uh, handoff. Um, first of all, great job on the presentation. You uh, certainly made 5-axis not look as intimidating as many people think it is. It's actually much easier than people think it is, so great job. 
Hey, we do have several questions. So I'll start with the first one, and this is a question for you. It said, you mentioned limiting the tool path to three or four axes. Is there a benefit in buying the five axis module for shops that don't have a five axis machine? Uh, I would have to say yes, definitely. Uh, if, if a shop does a lot of uh, three axis work, a lot of 3D work, especially molds and dies, or uh, really you know, any complex 3D work on a fairly regular basis, uh, the five axis module uh, provides a lot of advantages. Uh, you have additional very powerful tool paths beyond those that are uh, offered in the surfacing and the advanced 3D, which are also really good, but uh, it provides you additional tool paths to those. Uh, as you can see, it provides a lot of controls to those, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of controls to those tool paths. Um, very often, um, uh, you know, providing faster tool path, the, the adaptive roughing in the five axis is, is phenomenal. Um, there are just a, a lot of very fast, very high quality tool paths that will greatly benefit uh, somebody who only has a three axis machine or maybe a four axis machine. I, I, I would completely agree with you and I'd expand on your answer to say there's, there's a lot of advantages to applying five axis strategies to a non five axis part. This uh, increases tool life, allows you to cut faster because now you can use the whole side of the tool maybe to cut a surface versus just the, the tip of the tool. It's better for machine wear, better for tool life. Uh, there's many advantages to using five axis strategies on a non five axis part or machine. So, um, and also I would add that I think that's becoming more and more commonplace in a lot of shops that they're starting to see this and they're starting to use these strategies on, on the uh, three and four axis parts. All right, uh, next question. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, next question, also one for you. It says, in the software I'm familiar with, I, I usually get a ton of retracts during five axis toolpath. Can you control that better in Gibbs Cam? Uh, well, not knowing what you're coming from, I don't know uh, better or worse, but you certainly control it very, very well in Gibbs Cam. Uh, the, the linking page, uh, as I said, really kind of gives you control over how the tool gets from one place to another. Um, matter of fact, if, uh, if y'all will bear with me for just a few seconds, let me pull up a part uh, that I use in my, in my training, and I use it for a little bit of a different purpose, but uh, I, I think it will help explain this if y'all don't mind looking at just a slight little bit more tool path. Bring that down. And this is just a, a, a real simple part. But let me uh, go ahead and create some toolpath on here. Uh, and I'll do a five axis toolpath and we'll just stick with that half inch end mill, half inch ball mill. I'm gonna worry too much about the details here. And uh, I'll just do a morph between two curves. So more between two curves, my drive surface is going to be this, and uh, turn my edges on, and my first edit curve is going to be this one. All right, my first edit curve is going to be this one, and my second edit curve is going to be this one. And uh, again, we can control this toolpath as three axis, four axis, or five axis toolpath very, very simply right here. I'll just uh, leave it as it is, and I'm going to have the tool path uh, just stay normal to the surface. There's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, 3D shape. There, this is 3D shape. It's not flat. But uh, let me create that tool path. And, of course, oh, you know what I forgot to do? I broke my own rule. I didn't hit restore defaults. So it had retained some of that information. So let me just do it the right way. Uh, so we're going to do a morph between two curves. We have the drive surfaces set. Our first curve is going to be there. 
a second curve is going to be there. And now we'll create the tool path. All right. So a couple of things that I want to show you here. First off, we have a lot of retracts. Um, the second thing is that this line, this edge is straight, but these strokes are curving around that as they exceed it, as they go past it, they start wrapping around it because of the way uh, offset toolpath is handled. Now, uh, that can be uh, handled with this surface edge handling choice. I just say extend the edge curve and recalculate it, and those strokes will just extend on straight without curving around the ends. And that's kind of the function of this part in my training class. But also notice that we've got a whole boatload of retracts now. And again, that's handled in the link page. Very, very easy. Uh, each of these strokes is, uh, is a slice. So from here to here is a slice, here to here is a slice. And right now it's told to move directly from one slice to the next if it's a small gap. But a small gap is just 20% of my tool diameter. And then, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, the length between slices, sorry, the, uh, it moved direct between slices and it's 110% of my step over. Uh, my step over, I believe, is 50 thousandths. So 110% of 50 thousandths is 55 thousandths. So uh, if this distance from here to here at that angle is greater than 55 thousandths, then it considers that a large move between slices. Uh, so a couple of things I would change here typically would be I would have it follow surfaces rather than a direct move. Uh, but also, I would just change this definition from 110%, uh, let's make it uh, 500% of my step over. Uh, you know, that's a quarter inch. So let's recalculate. And we have one inch removed, one exit move, and no intermediate retracts. No. So the answer Fantastic. to the question is yes, we have very good control over retracts. Oh, fantastic. Looks like you've got a lot of control in the tool path. Um, the, the next question is one that I'll take. It's, it's a two-part question. And it says, if I already have a post for my machine, will it require an upgrade to support five axis? And the answer to that is yes. If it doesn't already support five axis, then you'll need to get an upgrade to do that. You can just work with your local reseller to determine what it'll take to get your post upgraded. The, the second part is, how about if I don't have a five-axis machine? And the answer to that is no. As long as you have a post that supports the machine, let's say it's a three-axis machine, as long as you have a post that supports the three-axis, then you don't need to upgrade it because when you select just the three-axis output, that's all you get is three-axis moves. So uh, depending on your situation, you may or may not need a post upgrade. All right. Uh, next question. It says, does Gibbs Cam 5 axis support uh, TCPC dynamic work fixture offsets? That's for you, David. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, the, the simple answer is yes, a resounding yes. Gibbs Cam fully supports tool center point control and dynamic work fixture offsets. Uh, no, no issues there, full support. Okay. Next question also for you. Uh, you showed finishing toolpath throughout your demonstration. I, can the five-axis module also do five-axis roughing? Uh, again, the answer is yes. Um, just real briefly, again, uh, with almost any of the tool paths that we select on the surface paths page, uh, we have a roughing tab uh, where you can define uh, uh, where you can define roughing routines based on your stock definition, taking multiple passes, plunge roughing, morphing a pocket depth cuts, uh, uh, area roughing, and, and so on. Uh, so, so there are a lot of options there for converting or for adapting a lot of the five-axis tool paths to roughing. But in addition to that, and to me more importantly, is we have this multi-axis machining, which has great, and I, I mean great, roughing routines. Um, and you can do offset roughing or adaptive roughing. Um, is very powerful, very flexible, very easy to use, frankly, uh, and, and gives you some really powerful, very effective roughing routines. So the answer is yes. Okay. 
Well, we've got a couple of more questions, and then we'll let it. Uh, we'll end the, the webinar after that. The, the next one is, and it touches a little bit on what you were just talking about, and again, one for you is, uh, do I have to buy the multi-blade option to bro program a single impeller? No. Um, while the multi-blade option makes programming an impeller a lot quicker and a lot simpler, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning when we were looking at the options tab, uh, the really all those specialty cut uh, styles do with selecting those, all that does is preset values and parameters that are available to you anyway uh, in the uh, in the seven tabs. Now it can be very confusing on some of these really complex parts um, and you know the first couple of times you go through it figuring out exactly what the combination is and that's why there are uh, for these really complex parts there are um, packages or add-ons that, that will handle that for you. But I've got a, a customer that I believe is actually uh, attending this webinar uh, who just recently bought the five axis module and I believe the very first part that he did with it uh, was a five axis impeller. Uh, he does not have the multi-blade option, uh, made a beautiful impeller uh, and that was his first, I believe his, either his first or second part with Gibbscam five axis. Uh, very successful. Uh, we worked through uh, and, and actually used the multi-axis uh, toolpath option roughing for roughing the impeller. Did a gorgeous job of it, uh, very very simply. And then the blades were mainly just a swarf cut. Uh, so so it was fairly simple. Now it, it wasn't the most complex impeller I've seen. We didn't um, you know. It, it wasn't ultra complex, but it it was machined very simply by a relative novice with Gibbscam five axis software, um, and you know probably you know took a couple of days to work through the toolpath and then machined it over this past weekend. Okay, well then, w would it be fair to say? that if you just do the occasional turbo component, such as an impeller, you, you don't need the multi-blade option, which is an application-specific piece of software for doing to turbo components. If you're just doing it occasionally, the five axis should work fine for you. It'll take a little more work, but you can do it. But if you're gonna be doing a lot of turbo uh, components, a lot of impellers, then you're, you're probably much better off getting uh, the multi-blade option. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, and that's actually where I was headed with that. I just forgot to wrap it up. Uh, you know, if, if I were in a job shop uh, that, you know, maybe once in a blue moon I have an impeller to do, uh, I don't think it would be, I, I don't think I would have a cost justification for uh, buying the uh, multi-blade option unless those impellers were really complex. Uh, for okay. just normal impellers, uh, if, if I just get a, get them on occasion, I don't think the multi-blade option is necessary. But if, if your bread and butter is multi-blade, uh, you know, you're doing impellers, you know, on a regular basis, I won't even say day in, day out, but if you see them on a regular basis, I think the time savings uh, in having the multi-blade option would pay for itself very, very quickly. I, I, I agree, and I would also say the same for porting. Uh, there's a special uh, module just for porting. Again, if you're only doing the occasional porting, uh, you may not need the, the five axis porting module, but if it's your bread and butter, then you may want to look at it. So for those options, you can obviously just contact your uh, local reseller and they can explain more, demo it for you, and discuss what it takes uh, to get those options. All right, well, one more question and then we'll uh, wrap up. And this one, David, we'll, we'll both kind of take uh, tur turns answering, but I'll start it. Uh, what training is available for five axis? So in almost every module of Gibbscam, there are many training options available that range from in person, whether uh, somebody comes to your site and does training or you go to the local resellers training center, um, or it could be done online or even uh, more park uh, corporate office out in California offers occasional training classes. And that's true for almost every module. It's less true when you get to um, 
more advanced applications like uh, MTM Swiss machining or, or five axis. In, in that case, you're really going to be limited to, uh, there are no online video, training videos available. You're going to be really uh, reduced to working with your local reseller. Um, and you're going to want to do that in person. Now, with that said, you could also do it online, but online live in person, not, not online training videos. So there's a few training options available that are, work very well. Uh, and again, we would just encourage you to work with your local reseller to see what training options they can offer. Any, any expansion on that? Uh, yeah, I would just say that uh, uh, those, those options are available for the wide variety of uh, GibbsCam options. When you get into five axis, uh, learning the fundamentals from a, what I would call a canned course uh, is good, but at the, at, when, when you get to the advanced training uh, on the five axis, it really needs to be based around your world. Uh, uh, the training that I would provide for somebody who's making them colors uh, would be vastly different from the training I'd provide for somebody that's making um, you know, automotive body dyes uh, or something like that. Right. Uh, just different worlds. Uh, they're both five axis machines. Uh, you know, they're all doing five-axis programming, but they're doing very, very different five-axis programming, right. and their training needs to mm -hmm. come. Uh, and once you get past the, the fundamentals of five-axis, the specifics need to be on the customer's parts, uh, if at all possible. Uh, so, yeah, that, I would agree with that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Five-axis, more than a lot of applications, you want to be doing the training uh, on the, the customer's parts, because, again, a wide range of different five-axis machining. So, with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, for any questions that we didn't get to, we will pass along to the local reseller so that they can follow up with you uh, directly. But uh, here, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. And uh, thanks for attending the, the webinar. And David, thanks for doing a great job. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, have, a, have a great day. Contact your reseller for more information or if you have any unanswered questions.